Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with this panel. Uh, Bill Gerstemeyer is uh, not going to uh, be able to be the moderator. He's tied up in uh, a tele teleconference. Uh, but uh, we have uh, Mike Barrett, who is going to uh, be the moderator for the panel, and he's uh, eminently well qualified to do that. Uh, of course, Mike uh, is an astronaut who's flown six months on the station, and also flown in the shuttle. Uh, has been a flight surgeon and uh, supported uh, Shuttle Mirror and the International Space Station as a flight surgeon. And now, of course, uh, his phone is a crewman. So let me turn it over to Mike. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Abbey, very much. Well, again, uh, it's really great to be here. This is an incredible assembly of minds, and uh, the international aspect, I think, makes it incredibly rich for us. Uh, today, I have the pleasure, the very unexpected pleasure, <laughs> of uh, moderating the EVA panel uh, for Mr. Gerstenmeyer. And uh, it's just like when he told me to take over the human research program, uh, here's the job, don't screw it up. So uh, that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, EVA is obviously something that's very near and dear to all of our heart. It's arguably the ultimate manned space experience, if you will. It's the closest you can be in the space environment and, and still survive it. Uh, and it is also a normal part of, of space operations, as we've uh, been proving again and again. Uh, this has actually been a banner year, this last year, for EVA uh, activity. Uh, some of this has dealt with uh, routine maintenance, a little bit of improvement and upgrades, uh, and a lot of unplanned EVAs that had a profound impact on station failures that really uh, impact our uh, ability to work as a, uh, a mature laboratory up there. And I think what we're seeing now is a shift from EVAs very much oriented towards the assembly of this massive uh, platform to one that's more reflective of the, the cadence of EVA that we're going to see uh, from now on just as we operate this station. So it'll be much more oriented towards maintenance, towards repair, uh, and then the occasional upgrades as we go. So this is kind of the natural history of EVA required to support a platform, and it's probably very similar to what we would have in a surface operation as well. So uh, with this, uh, I, I would also add that we had a fairly stark reminder of the, how hazardous this activity is. Again, the, the, uh, the margin is very slim between the person and the spaceflight environment. And I think a lot of you are aware that we had a mishap involving a crew member whose helmet effectively uh, began to fill with water and it became a very dangerous situation to us. Now at the same time, station is a stepping stone and we're looking towards deep space exploration and we, along with that, need to develop a very robust EVA capability for surface operations on the moon, Mars, and uh, eventually an asteroid. And of course, these have very long lead times. Uh, so we need to get our heads around this question while we're operating station, and if we can leverage station to help us develop any of these, uh, we would like to do that. So to give expert opinions on some of the questions in these areas, we've got uh, a, an expert panel, which I, I can safely say has a, a lot of experience working in a vacuum uh, assembled here, <laughs> and we're really excited to have them. Um, and I'm going to try to shorten the bios, and I'm, I'm just not going to do you guys justice, so just get over that, um, because uh, what, what you guys have done is, is just incredible. But I'd really like us to get on to some of the questions. Uh, Mike Gernhardt, uh, uh, background in bioengineering, professional diving, uh, veteran of four shuttle flights, uh, 43 days in space, I believe, four spacewalks? Yep. And uh, obviously, uh, for those of you familiar with the EVA and DCS community, Mike has been instrumental in leading some of our knowledge and physiologic uh, response to the EVA environment, in particular decompression protocols uh, to keep us safe out there as we do our spacewalks. Um, Sergey Krikalov, legendary cosmonaut, I could stop there. Uh, <laughs> but of course, he has a background in uh, mechanical engineering. He's a veteran of uh, two long duration missions on the Mir station. Two shuttle missions, including the first Russian to fly on a U.S. vehicle. Uh, I, I met Sergey in December of 91, I believe. It's amazing. 92. Yeah. 92, okay. It seemed a long time. <laughs> um, but obviously very instrumental in our, our joint work together as well. Uh, he was a member of the Expedition 1 crew, also, also Expedition 11, and uh, is the record holder for cumulative time in space, 803 days. A veteran of eight spacewalks. Uh, obviously has held many leadership uh, positions, uh, most recently as head of GCTC. Uh, Mike Lopez Alegria, uh, formal aviator and test pilot, uh, came to the astronaut office in 1992, a veteran of three space shuttle flights and one long duration flight on the uh, space station Expedition 14, veteran of 10 EVAs, 67 hours as our U.S. record holder, I believe the one to beat. 
Um, not quite Anatoly Solovia, but, but very close, uh, but obviously held in high esteem from us. Uh, Paolo Nespoli, the pride of Italy, uh, background in aerospace engineering, um, aero astro uh, uh, engineering as well. He's got a, a very distinguished military career as a parachute instructor, jump master, high altitude, low opening uh, special forces activity. Uh, and the crown of his uh, experience, I think, was spending a week in a cave in Sardinia with me and, uh, and a few other folks. Uh, very tough guy. <laughs> but uh, also a veteran of two space flights and uh, in particular has uh, worked a lot getting people dressed and ready to go uh, to get them outside, which is not a, a trivial thing, which I have done with him. Uh, Sergei Rosansky, it's good to have a, a fellow medical person. Uh, Sergey has a background in biochemistry and a professional career at the Institute of Biomedical Problems. Uh, he was no, selected as a cosmonaut in uh, 2003. He actually uh, participated in the isolation study uh, evolving towards the Mars 520 mission and spent 100 and something, 105 days or so. Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. Uh, in that chamber uh, as part of that evolving program. So he gets the isolation part of the equation. He also uh, recently completed a long duration mission on uh, the ISS. Um, along with Oleg Kotov, he's a veteran of three spacewalks and I believe shares the record with Oleg Kotov for the longest duration Russian EVA of eight hours and s three minutes? Seven. Seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I depend on you guys to fill in, it's great. Uh, Vladimir Titov, uh, colonel from the uh, Russian Air Force, came to the Cosmonaut Corps in 1976. Uh, uh, veteran of four space flights and one very exciting near space flight that uh, some of you may know about. Uh, he's our hero for, for that, if nothing else. But he also uh, spent one year, as we talked about earlier, on the Mir space station and is also a veteran of uh, two space shuttle flights. Uh, he's done three EVAs, uh, which is why he's with us today. Uh, Koichi Wakata, he's still smoking from reentry. He just landed <laughs> um, just very, just May, May 12th, May 13th? 13th. May 13th, so uh, just freshly returned. A uh, veteran of uh, three space shuttle flights, two long duration flights on the ISS, one of them with me, so uh, another person of immense tolerance. Um, <laughs> has uh, uh, not had uh, EVA experience, but has had extensive experience in suit preparation and maintenance, and again, getting people ready to go out. Uh, recent ad, thank you very much, Dr. David Wolf, uh, veteran of uh, four flights, one of those being a long duration flight on the Mir space station during the uh, Shuttle Mir program. Uh, seven EVAs. Uh, he was known as the Yoda of EVA for our class for quite some time and uh, was chief of the EVA branch for the astronaut office during our, our big EVA surge in support of space station assembly. Uh, you could not get a better <laughs> group of people to, uh, to answer some of these questions, so we're really happy to have them. So I would like to, uh, uh, rather than just have everybody uh, speak, I would like to ask some questions and uh, I'll probably point them at one person. And uh, let's see, see how that goes. And I would like to invite audience participation before we leave a question so that we get a little bit of uh, involvement out there. So first, um, I, I think people are um, understand that we, spaceflight is still very new. We've considered the space shuttle as a test vehicle in some ways. And every flight was a test flight. And I think the same could be said of the, uh, the Russian Soyuz. Um, now, we recently had this wake-up call with the EMU, and in my mind, this shows us that EVA is very similar and that we're acting on an environment which we don't entirely understand with hardware that we don't entirely understand. Uh, and so every EVA sortie is, is rather a, a test flight, if you will, uh, and it's hazardous. So my first question, um, which I'm going to put to uh, Mike lopez Alegria is for our current activity of station maintenance, wh what are our limitations right now uh, for our EVA suits and systems for low Earth orbit? Thanks, Mike. Um, so I, I think I would categorize them in, in a couple ways. Um, let me just tell a story. When, uh, when I was on ISS for Expedition 14, uh, we had a certain uh, shuttle flight that was planned to come up uh, at a certain time, and of course that time for the onboard crew is very busy and it's sort of blocked off, and for a, a technical reason that I can't recall, the shuttle was delayed by uh, several weeks, and uh, so we had this big chunk of time where we really didn't have anything planned. And there's always a list of items to go do EVA-wise that you know aren't quite critical enough to go do them right now, but something that you would you put in the in the job jar, as they called it. And so the question was, why don't we just bring those things forward, 
and conduct, conduct an EVA? And the answer was because uh, it's too hard and we're not ready. So the, the fact is that um, planning an EVA is a very meticulous and painstaking process that really takes months to develop. And so getting to the question, you know, if you have a maintenance EVA um, that happens because a piece of equipment that's critical breaks and you get, need to go fix it as soon as possible, the chances are good right now that we have an, uh, a procedure put together for that and, and the, the uh, pump failure that happened a few years ago and some other things that have happened more recently have helped us um, gel those plans so that we can react more quickly to go do that sort of thing. But in, in the past, it has always been a struggle to have uh, things that were not in that critical list, and I don't know if the number is 10 or 12, um, things that we actually practice um, in a canned fashion underwater in the pool so the crews understand it, the ground team understands it, and you can just sort of suitcase that and go do it. If something falls below that threshold, it's actually pretty challenging to figure out translation paths, um, tether protocol, all that sort of thing, which requires teams on the ground to put a crew in the NBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, um, where we practice these things and all that. So our response time, I think, has improved quite a bit for some of these um, major EVAs that we can predict. But if something were to happen that we have not predicted or is not you know, across that boundary that I mentioned that makes it you know, sort of super critical, um, then it will take some time to put it together. Okay, would someone else like to comment on that as well? So one question, uh, it sounds like from a limitation standpoint, you're focusing on the practice, not the systems, not the hardware capabilities so much. Yeah, I was going to also mention something about the system, but I think it's, it's kind of um, obvious that we had this failure with uh, Luca Parmentano's suit, and, um, and that was on the heels of a, a different water filter-based problem that it took a long time to solve. And of course, when, that, when there's something wrong, the fleet is down, so to speak, and you, you know, you basically don't do EVAs unless you absolutely have to. And I think there was uh, probably a lot of gnashing of teeth that went on during this last um, EVA when we did have a failure that they needed to go outside and fix. So, I mean, the suits are extremely sensitive. Um, this water chemistry thing has been very uh, challenging for the teams to get their arms around. And I'm not an expert on this, um, having left NASA a couple years ago, but as I understand it, the very fix that they instituted to uh, respond to the last water chemistry problem may have contributed to this water chemistry problem. So it's a, a really delicate balance. And so I guess the sophistication of the suits <coughs> drives a certain fussiness. And we've got to you know, predict and prepare and protect against that the best we can. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that uh, with that suit failure, the suit you were out of business. Why don't we really share the suits rather than uh, just be limited to the U.S. to the U.S. suits and the Russians to the Russian suits? That's uh, question three on our list here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, le le uh, let me ask one question of our <laughs> Russian colleagues, and we can make that question too. So uh, Mike mentioned the overhead of preparing for an EVA, not a trivial thing. And I'd like to ask uh, Sergei Murzansky, from the standpoint of the Russian Orlon, how complicated is it to prepare for an EVA and how much of an impact is on Russian segment operations? Well, from uh, Russian side, it's uh, much easier to prepare for EVA. Um, we have another kind of problems that we now are discussing with our instructors uh, that um, uh, U.S. way of preparing for EVAs that it is um, um, standard partial training and uh, um, it's easier to uh, combine than the real EVA from these standard pieces of work. Uh, Russian way of, of uh, training is we train the exact EVA, uh, exact picture, and then of course it's changed during flight and everything goes uh, not like it was planned uh, as usual but still we have uh, this kind of training um, that's why for uh, Russian side it's easier to prepare suits but it's uh, hard to prepare for for example for the emergency EVA uh, because 
it still need to be scheduled, trained on Earth, and so on. Right. So before we move a little bit from this, are there any questions from the audience? Any other questions about the complexity of our system now? <clears throat> Okay, so I'd, I'd like to put Sergei Krikalov on the spot then and ask about cross-training between our two systems now. Um, I cannot tell about cross, big cross-training uh, on suits now because <coughs> now everyone is using their own suits, but on early days of uh, space station, uh, actually even uh, shuttle and Mir flights, uh, American astronauts were trained on Russian suit and uh, Russian astronauts were trained on American suit. So I think uh, it takes a little extra training, but it gives uh, the system much more flexibility. So we, we have uh, experience of uh, U.S. astronaut actually doing EVA in Russian suits and vice versa. Uh, uh, I remember I remember when we just uh, started uh, ISS program before, uh, actually before Expedition 1. Uh, actually, we were together on uh, some kind of test run uh, in U.S. suits in NBL working uh, to develop procedures for future, for future missions. Uh, so I think it's conven convenient. It's also convenient and useful to have um, an experience because we can learn from each other. And uh, what Sergei said, that we had a um, different approach for the training. Uh, for example, when I, was, when I just started training here in Houston, uh, and we started training for ISS program, I was surprised how many uh, test run in NBL we need for each EVA. I think at that time, number was about 10, 10 dive for one EVA. Uh, in my second flight uh, on Russian side, I did seven EVA. So in this case, I would need 70 runs underwater, and it would be too much. So we had little, a little more basic training uh, in Russian suit uh, usually, and then approximately two dive for each EVA. So now I think uh, our numbers are getting closer. Uh, we have more experience. We don't need to rehearse so many times the same move, but uh, I think it's useful to have cross-training. Yeah. Um, so I want to add that uh, it is really important to have uh, cross-training. Like in our flight, when uh, US side had two additional emergency EVAs, and um, uh, Kaichi was uh, responsible for can the arm and preparing uh, everything, and time for uh, preparation was really limited. And so uh, for Kaichi, it was uh, work with Canada Arm, uh, testing all protocols and helping guys suit up and prepare for EVA. <coughs> Russian side really could help, but for me, without any knowledge of uh, US suits, it was a little bit uh, difficult uh, that, uh, that, of course, I told after EVAs that with some practice before, I could be really helpful um, when guys are going outside or coming back. Uh, also, there was some uh, need to help to speed up uh, uh, removing suits. So it was, it was really a uh, bad thing. Uh, not to have uh, practice, not to have enough knowledge to be able to help. <laughs> Maybe one more word on cross-connecting. Uh, not only cross-training for Russian astronauts, for American suit and vice versa, but also um, in early days, uh, there was actually even some engineering efforts done to, to be able to use U.S. airlock for Russian suit. Mm -hmm and Russian airlock for U.S. suit. That's also good things to do. It was never uh, experienced, never tested, but uh, from engineering point of view, it was done. So again, it give uh, the system a <coughs> little more flexibility. That, that's yeah. an interesting point. I actually worked on that in the early 90s, and there was a time there where internally we were looking at, does it make sense to do a joint U.S.-Russian suit and have a single airlock? And 
There were a lot of advantages there and for any number of reasons that you might imagine that never happened. Uh, we did scar the U.S. airlock to, to be compatible with the right. Russian suit, and as Sergey points out, we've never done that. But I think that's an interesting question going forward as we do exploration. You know, in these deep space missions, you don't have the logistics, and, and the mass is huge. And, you know, do we want two suits? Uh, there's an argument that that's nice that we've had that on, on station and, and the dissimilar stuff, but at the same time, can we afford the mass? And is that something we ought to think about looking forward? And if we do, we probably need to do some, uh, some equipment to be able to use uh, each other hardware. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. exactly. So just quick. It was when we, <laughs> uh, we had a fan, when the EMUs were down, the U.S. suits were down for the fan pump separator was having a corrosion problem. <clears throat> the, an RPC failed on S0, and we used two Orlons on the U.S. segment, which had never been tried before on the ground. We did a quick test run, and I think a U.S. crew member was in one of the Orlons. But a anyway, having the backup suit system was very important during, we were down for a good long time with that fan pump separator. I'm gonna estimate a year and a half, something on that order. Okay, and actually with, <clears throat> without trying to lead the uh, panel too much, given the fan pump separator issue, the recent helmet issue, and the not exploration analog that we are uh, experience we're having now, but the big complex platform, uh, is there a feeling that a redundant capability is, is not a bad idea? I think that's what David just said. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, but, and so I'm, I'm just it's always a, a little, good idea the right. more you can get. And, right. Um, yeah. I don't think a person going out into the environment would ever say anything different. Now there's practical limitations, we understand. Okay, clearly stated. Uh, just for the audience, uh, the, as uh, Dr. Gernhardt mentioned, we are scarred for Orlon operations. That means we have interfaces and um, indicators, connections in the U.S. airlock for the Orlon suit. And as mentioned, we've never fully tested it, but that was the, uh, the going in notion for the airlock. That's if people can get a uh, spacesuit ready for EVA, cognitive <laughs> is, is fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the first part of the question on physiologic monitoring, uh, Mike, do you want to? Just yeah. Give us um, a synopsis of that. For so in the EMU, we, we measure um, metabolic rate through oxygen consumption. We measure CO2. Um, and that's about, and then we have a heart rate monitor, mm -hmm. uh, which depending on the criticality of the EVA, if that fails, we'll still go EVA. And it depends a little bit on the background of the crew and so forth. But it's not extensive. Um, I'm not totally familiar with all the Russian measurements, but I think you have more physiological measurements in your suit. Mm -hmm. Going forward into exploration, um, I've been leading the EVA physiology effort, looking at all that. And if you look at the Apollo program, out of the EVAs that were done, there were <clears throat> 10 instances where they came back to the LEM with less than 10% consumables remaining, in one case, 1% left. Oh, and, and so we really want, in going forward, to have uh, at least two measurements of metabolic <coughs> rate um, and, and, and additional uh, feedback to the crew in terms of uh, we actually developed this voice interactive system that would tell the crew what their limiting consumable was and get them heading back before they ran out of, out of consumables. That's going to be important when we start doing these high frequency EVAs in the exploration environment. Yeah, one thing you didn't mention, in, in the EMU there's also a CO2 sensor which also can fail in flight and or in during a spacewalk. And it, it has. And, yeah, it has, and we'll continue the spacewalk, you know, based on other things. I think it's no-go before the EVA. <coughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
And I'll add, I think I was the last U.S. guy to go out in an Orlon, and uh, our CO2 sensors both failed in both suits. And so we had to have vigorous discussion with the ground, and uh, I think our relationship with the medical group in the, uh, the Russian EVA Flight Control Center had a lot to do with us being able to go out and monitor our own systems. And we also have training on CO2 levels, so mm -hmm. the crews are trained to experience what their physiology yeah. is and make that judgment call. Jay. Um, so the, the two suits both take different approaches to different design trade-offs. For those of you who've had the chance to use both suits, how much of a deal is the different pressure uh, you know, that they're related to? I mean, one's the oil under the higher pressure, right, so the EMU. Mm -hmm. Has that proved to be significant or in operational use? <clears throat> Well, so my experience, um, I did two Orlon EVAs in the restaurant, the EMU, and I, so obviously the higher pressure allows a lot less overhead in terms of a pre-breathe protocol, which is great. Um, the, uh, entry into the Orlon is much easier. It's, it's a more comfortable suit. Uh, I will say that the pressure, I, I noticed it most in the gloves, and I'm not sure if it's glove design or, or pressure. I mean, there's obviously an element of both. Both. Right. both. But, yeah. But the, the, what they call the phase six gloves and the EMU are vastly superior. I mean, they're really amazing you know, pieces of engineering hardware. Um, I don't really think there was a whole lot of difference in terms of you know, upper body movement. Of course, lower body movement is really not that important. The other thing that I noticed is that the, uh, <clears throat> the, pl the backpack on the Orlon is quite a bit longer. And somehow I noticed a, a fairly significant difference in um, a sort of mass moment of inertia in terms of pitch in the uh, Orlon. It w was much more difficult to move around in. And you don't really get a good sense of that in the Hydro Lab, which is the uh, Russian equivalent of the EVA, um, I'm sorry, the NBL. And the reason is in the, in the, in the Hydro Lab, the Orlon is um, quite heavily, um, it's neutrally buoyant, but it, it has a very strong writing moment, so it'll return you to a certain <coughs> orientation all the time. And so when you get out of that orientation, you, it's really a lot of work to hold yourself there. And so I think that sort of masks this uh, mass moment of inertia um, rotation issue that I, that I felt in space. I, I think those are the biggest things um, in terms of differences. Uh, but you know, so it, you could say, look, I'm willing to give up <clears throat> the dexterity because I want to be able to do, I, I want to be able to get out the door quickly without a big pre-breathe. Um, so it, it's an ops trade-off. Mm -hmm. And I think Velodia has also done EVAs in our US EMU on STS-84. Am I remembering that correctly? 86, maybe. 86, I'm sorry. And 86, so partly correctly. So I would like to hear your impressions on the difference between the Orlon and the EMU. Uh, that spacewalk was rather interesting. Uh, it was STS-63. Uh, I asked Jim Voss, my commander, uh, to do an EVA. Um, Jim told me that only U.S. citizens can use EMU, and I was, did not manage to do that. But at STS-86, the, the situation was different, and Mr. Abbey uh, helped in this case, and uh, I uh, was allowed to walk with uh, Scott Parazinski. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to different. I used three types of spacesuit in my career, and two of them were unplanned. The first one was uh, the old type of spacesuit with the hoses. I had to carry a bunch of hoses behind me during my walk. Uh, you know, when you go to your walk space, it's okay, but when you uh, go back, those hoses that you are carrying behind you, they are like, uh, like uh, a giant uh, uh, asminog uh, that is dragging everything and picking up everything behind you. After that, the suit was modified. 
and I walked with um, um, Musa Manarov without the whole system and on STS-86 it was also modern. So about the two um, unplanned EVAs that I performed, those had to do with the um, a quant a telescope exterior equipment repairs. Um, that system was not supposed to be repaired. It's not like service Hubble. You know, you open the doors, you know what to do, uh, you, you know, swap some electronic blocks and leave. No, here you come over and everything is blocked. You have to cut through the shell. You have to uh, unscrew the uh, um, uh, captive screws, and we've been getting ready for that for about two years. We've been talking to the ground about that a lot. We talked to the ground a lot. Uh, we had some pictures, we got some documentation, we received the tools, we prepared for that EVA. And when we started the spacewalk, when we opened all the uh, panels, not the panels, but when we cut it through, and when we got to telescope um, area and we removed a bunch of screws, and we took the tool uh, to open the last latch, uh, that tool got broken. And of course, it was not tested. It was a Dutch-made uh, tool for telescope specially, and of course, uh, technologically, it was uh, uh, erroneous because the materials, be the material um, of the tool uh, became uh, crumbly in low temperature. And then we were waiting for four more months to get uh, new cutters, new tools, new documentation. Uh, we, just did, we just didn't have uh, any explosives to blow the whole thing off, but um, otherwise we actually managed and we completed the repairs. There is one more thing. First of all, unplanned EVAs are possible. They are, this is based on the experience that we have gathered um, during training and during the actual spacewalks, and uh, they do come to practice. As to the time interval from the beginning of the mission to the EVA, uh, six months after the start of the mission, I don't know if many people actually performed that. That was our second spacewalk. And the third EVA we performed 10 months after the beginning of our mission. That was unprecedented. The medical team that was supporting us was very worried about our condition. Uh, they were wondering how we're going to perform 10 months after being in space. However, all the operations performed we performed quite, quite correctly, and we managed the mission. And the last thing about uh, training for cosmonauts and astronauts before EVA. I have uh, spent a lot of time in NBL uh, being prepared for shuttle Mir docking mission. And what I did not like, I didn't like, when the whole timeline, six hours, you were supposed to stay under water. Because the real work only lasts three hours, and three hours is just a waste of time. Uh, I think this is not um, um, substantiated. This is just um, unreasonable use of time and resources. Maybe those three remaining hours would be good to use for cosmonauts and astronauts to go through some standard operations, say, uh, modeling, mating, demating, cutting, breaking, uh, drilling, whatever is needed to be done, uh, some uh, typical standard operations that will uh, provide for some basis for them. It may be useful for any EVA, even unplanned, whether it is R&R &R or uh, maintenance. Uh, that was my idea. And uh, see, since that time, I have not changed my mind. I think this is my advice. Thank you very much. Any questions? Obviously, the uh, the Hydrolab sessions are three hours each, and the Orlon EVAs are quite a bit longer than that, and things seem to work out quite nicely. And obviously, a lot in there. 
Um, I would like to shift a little bit towards the concept of international standards for EVA, and I'm going to put uh, Koichi and Paolo <clears throat> a little bit on the spot. Um, but uh, the notion of going forward with exploration, and, uh, not talking about choosing atmospheres or suit pressures or anything, uh, and another international project, uh, is, what is the interest from the international partners in participating in EVA capability development? Goichi-san, we'll start with you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, International Space Station Program uh, gave us a lot of opportunity to learn uh, spacewalk uh, hardware as well as the operations. And in Japan, we have uh, we used to have a neutral buoyancy laboratory, a smaller version of NBL that we have uh, in Houston. And that facility was used uh, for the development of the uh, Japanese experiment module and also uh, Konotori spacecraft, that's an H2 transfer vehicle. There are a lot of uh, EVA hardware uh, interface that need to be verified or checked or developed, so uh, that facility was used. So we uh, used uh, Hamilton standard uh, provided uh, uh, EMU, uh, uh, water version of EMU for the uh, testing and then uh, the development was very successful. We had a lot of support from U.S. crew members like uh, Dave and uh, Leroy and uh, many U.S. astronauts supported those uh, activities. And uh, so the, the phase of uh, EVA hardware development is very successful in Japan. However, uh, that facility was uh, severely damaged three years ago when we had a large East Japan earthquake and uh, now it's decommissioned and then unfortunately we are no longer using the facility. And uh, Japan is now uh, undergoing basic uh, research of uh, a space suit like uh, fabric, uh, like a liquid cooling uh, and ventilation garment mm -hmm. and also the materials that will be used for the space suit as well as uh, environmental control and life support system like CO2 removal, uh, thermal control, and uh, like oxygen provision and uh, stuff like that. And um, as you may recall, Japan is really uh, uh, interested in, in, in the uh, development field of uh, materials like uh, cloth, clothing, and then uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastics and uh, stuff like that. And uh, in JAXA, we are going through a fundamental or basic research of uh, materials that will be used for the spacesuits, uh, like thin layer and uh, more efficient uh, liquid cooling uh, uh, garment, like on the US and in the Russian suit, um, liquid cooling is used for the, uh, the cooling inside of the uh, spacesuit, and uh, JAXA is uh, doing some research of combining airflow together with the uh, liquid cooling for the purpose of controlling the uh, heat reduction inside of the spacesuit. So hopefully in the future, uh, oh, it's really a, <coughs> makes sense to have redundancy in the different suits by having multiple countries having different suits. But for the future development, maybe some country uh, can participate in the uh, development of a new suit by not providing the entire suit, but for example, like subsystem, like an ECLUS portion, or materials, or just the, uh, some uh, joint of a space suit in that kind of effort. Uh, so uh, we, we may be able to seek for a different kind of collaboration or cooperation for space, space suit development in the future. Right. And if I could ask quickly, how much of that research is collaborative at this point, or is that internal to JAXA? That is internal to JAXA, together with the, uh, the industry, because the uh, uh, manufacturing industry is really interested in applying that, what they have to uh, space activities. Mm -hmm. Actually, what JAXA and then uh, industries cooperated in developing this new LCVG, it's already on the, uh, on the market, and it's used for firefighters' uh, undergarment, and actually probably costs about $600, but you can buy it uh, you know, for sports and leisure uh, activities. And, and so uh, there's a lot of interest in, in Japan in the industry level. And, and so maybe we can use that technology for future development. Okay, thank you. Paolo, for uh, ESA or OSI? Well, um, yes, I, I, I was listening to what Koichi was saying, and essentially it's the same thing going on in Europe. I mean, uh, also in Europe, uh, we had uh, our own NBL, it's called NBF, just to be a little bit similar. <laughs> um, uh, but actually, never 
physically used it for actual EVA training with the suit, except once in the 90s when uh, the Russians were invited there and they came with their own suits, their own everything, and they did, uh, they did a, a series of uh, dives in there with some of our astronauts, um, like if, if they were in the, Newton, uh, in the um, Hydro Lab. Um, so it's interesting. We build the facilities and then we kind of not find a way to really use them. Um, but uh, robotics, uh, EVAs are all the things that are really interesting. Also, ESA developed uh, ERA, which is a European robotic arm, also similar technology. So there is a lot of interest uh, there in, uh, in going further. And there are a lot of studies, uh, relatively little studies, most of them managed uh, at uh, ESTEC, at the European Space Technology Center in uh, Holland, uh, about fabrics, about cooling, about a better uh, um, system for uh, uh, taking away CO2 or even recycling it. But, but nothing is up to the point where we could actually physically build a suit. Uh, I think uh, you know, this idea of, uh, of uh, having two different suits or three different suits or four different suits, it's a good idea in a certain way because it gives redundancy. But at the same time, I think it's, uh, it's kind of time that we start thinking of uh, kind of let's do a human uh, exploration to Mars or to somewhere and let's just put resources together. Maybe, you know, space station is a good example how we could do stuff, but we could do much more together and pull our resources uh, together. And uh, so I'm looking forward for this to happen. Thank you, Paolo. Anyone else on the panel on the topic of international standards or suit development? Um, I might make a few comments. Um, going forward in exploration, it's a, it's a different environment than station because we don't have the, the logistics resupply and so forth. So I think we do want to drive towards standards it's probably not a bad idea to have a couple of different suits, but they should have standard interfaces, um, the same umbilical interface, the same oxygen supply pressure, the same water. You know, we can't use the Russian water in our suits. So things like that, I, I think we need to drive uh, toward commonality. And if we end up with a couple of different egress methods, maybe an airlock or a suit port or something, I'll talk about that later. We ought to probably make that happen where they are compatible. Uh, some of you remember STS-80 where the hatch wouldn't open. And I always joke about that, but before all my EVAs, we'd have a party to see who could come up with the, the most bizarre thing that could happen in your EVA. <laughs> and, I, and it always started once you were outside and, and <laughs> the hatch didn't open. And so if, if you're on an exploration mission and your hatch fails and you can't get out, you're in trouble. So I think we need to be smart. Um, it's very difficult to, you know, to engineer to common out at the subsystem level. But I think with those higher level standards I talked about, that, that would allow some flexibility and you know maybe <coughs> even push to common joint interfaces on the suits where you could even mix and match parts and so that's something we, we really need to, to keep our eye on going forward okay anyone else from the panel mike it's better for the hatch to not open before you go out than not close after you're out. <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> which did happen to uh, Anatoly and, uh, and yeah, I, I remember that well, Dave. <laughs> Which I think is probably the record EVA if we go recount it, but they may not have counted the time at vacuum inside the airline, <laughs> which was about five hours. Wow. Trying to fix it. Yeah. I want to mention one thing about big difference in the two suit systems. There's only what 12 EMUs in existence, and they take a one-way trip up to space, and and they've been upgraded over the years, but they're basically only 11 or 12 machines. The Russian assembly line is open, yeah. and they can be upgraded as time goes on, and, and they go up and uh, they don't come back home. Well, this has really come to a head without the shuttle now, because we only have a limited number to last the rest of the time that we have on ISS. And, and you <coughs> have been engaged more recently with this. I, I think we've got that, if all goes well, stretched out, which took a major program in servicing on orbit equipment that was meant to be serviced on the ground. Yeah, and, and we do, although we're, we're still struggling since we've encountered new problems we didn't anticipate in, in planning right. that out. We can't out. react with uh, design upgrades because the assembly line is closed. Right, that's a great point. And uh, it goes into exploration. Right. The assembly well, line will be closed when you're on Mars too. And another point, Dave, that, that you alluded to, um, 
our, our plus is not real easy to work on, and our suits are not real easy to work on. And, and going forward into exploration, um, and I don't have a lot of experience with the Orlon, but it seems like things are a lot more accessible and it's easier to the mix and match spare parts and so forth. And, and that's got to be a philosophy I think we build into our exploration suits. Yes. Do we have a way of getting a, a new uh, U.S. suit up? Yes. Or what does it come up on? The, I believe either the HTV or the ATV could handle a U.S. suit. Just yeah, Dragon actually uh, brought up a new uh, Dragon, that's right, and that's also right. HTV is certified to do that too. It's a one-way <coughs> trip right. and being serviced, not meant to be serviced. I don't know. They were meant to be brought back and rejuvenated <coughs> in every set of EVAs. Right. Charlie. My question is uh, maybe along the lines of Vanessa's in the previous panel. You're talking about the EVA system and your work associated with EVA. What about the rest of the system we designed to support you? Is the training proficiency on orbit or the countermeasures training so you're physically, you feel physically prepared, the nutrition is there, the rest of the training attributes. So as we design missions and vehicle systems to support EVAs going into exploration, what are the other attributes that we can pay attention to as well as simplifying the suit or the interchangeability of the, the material? Any comments on that regard? I, I think a big one that's, that's huge is how you design your EVA interfaces. And like the Russian Orlon doesn't have as good a gloves as our Phase 6, but they don't need them. They've got simple interfaces. The suit works great for what they need to do with it. And uh, we have much more uh, finicky interfaces and, and things like that. And, and, and so if you have standards for your EVA interfaces, that will drive more commonality between the suits. Paolo. Uh, I wanted to, to to touch, you know, when we talk about EVA, we always think about, we always think about the guys going outside. And <clears throat> I, I never did an EVA, but I, I have a lot of experience on being inside uh, doing IV, which is, yes, suiting up the guys, but also directing them for seven hours and telling them what to do because you can have somebody out there and doesn't know what to do, then, then it's, uh, it's, it's not used, not, it's not of much use. Um, so I've, I've seen a shift because I did, a, I did the IV on the shuttle, STS-120, uh, right there. You're sitting right there in the cockpit uh, talking to the guy a few meters away from you. But now I see a shifting on doing the IV guys on the ground because obviously it's complicated on a long duration mission to have that person up there. But what is going to happen if you're on Mars? I mean, you cannot have an IV from the ground. It's simply impossible. So you, you really have to go back again to have the, the IV sitting there on the inside the, the structure, the spacecraft, whatever it is. Maybe, so maybe to go even further, to, to have crew more autonomous. Because on Mir station, we did six hours EVA. No one inside the station. My partner and I put on suit, just two of us, help each other and we don't need uh, three people around you to help you with, uh, with the suit. And then when we went out, we didn't have continuous comb with the ground. So I had all procedures for six hours on a small piece of paper, put it on my mirror, and I check uh, all times and all I need to do uh, with me. So I think, uh, returning back to previous panel, I think we need to think uh, more about uh, to be crew more autonomous. We are talking about uh, ability to crew to stay longer on the station, but this, uh, this is much easier problem uh, rather than do right hardware and procedures. Because right now with developing all stuff you, you are explaining, we are getting more and more connected to the ground. We should train to be more autonomous. And that's, that's uh, as a joke, I suggest many years ago saying, well, if we really want to get prepared for uh, exploration missions, uh, for, for the beginning, let's cut communication for a week with the station. We don't need to fly a year. We need to, to, to cut communication and see what's going on. And then maybe to make a debrief. And if something goes wrong, then we switch communication on and realize that things are not going uh, the way we expected. So I think uh, rather than uh, <coughs> test ability of human to stay longer and longer in space, 
uh, that's what you said also on, on your talk on previous panel that uh, the question of responsibility is actually probably is harder task rather than staying longer in inside the closed environment so with uh, with a not only suit but other uh, hardware we need to to create hardware to be more uh, autonomous to train crew to change procedures and uh, it's to, and change procedures on the ground as you said uh, with um, developing all our communication systems we get more and more attached to the ground and in order to to do exploration we have to use to be detached more may i it's also uh, to change the way of thinking Mm -hmm. uh, both uh, Cosmos and Astronauts and uh, MCC. And actually, unfortunately, what I see, I compare uh, the way we trained for MIR missions, and the main thing we were trained on was what to do if something goes wrong. And if you analyze uh, training flow, I think just 10% we are training for, uh, for what we are going to do, and 90% is what, going, what we are going to do if something happened. And because price of the mistake is very high, it's reasonable to do. Now approach uh, for the training, if something goes wrong, we ask ground. And sometimes not even if something goes wrong, just uh, to do regular daily activity. A crew is uh, basically wired to the ground all the time and became a remote unit to push buttons. <laughs> and and that's, that's wrong approach. You know, Sergey, you raise a really interesting point, and in many ways, we need to go back to the some of the past, the way the Mir operated without com, just intermittent radio contact, and we've had a model closer than the current ISS model for operating in an exploration mode. We yeah. went though outside of suit issues. <laughs> well, um, actually, they're they're very germane, I think, to suit issues. I would I I like the way this is this discussion is going because I have felt in many ways that we are really needing more to decrease our dependence on the ground. My devil's advocate question is: We're operating a laboratory, which in our country is the ins the National Lib uh, Institute of Health, for instance, and so it's it's a platform which we hope to learn some exploration on. But it's a very complex laboratory that we're trying to maintain and and stay productive. So my question is, would we change the way we operate normally for EVA, or should we design deliberate experiments or developments or demonstrations that include autonomous EVA? Well, I mean, I think you bring up a good point, and that is we are living on the vehicle that we designed, and, and it was designed not to be autonomous. Correct. You know, this experiment that Sergey refers to, you know, that would not work, period, if you didn't allow mission control to do commanding and that sort of thing, right? Which which you won't be able to do in a Mars journey after some point probably, but um, <clears throat> will not work on the ISS because the ISS was designed to be talked to from the ground, manipulated from the ground, et cetera. Likewise, the interfaces that were built for EVA, all the um, assembly tasks, many of the maintenance tasks, they're pretty complicated, which is why we do up to 10 runs for every run that we, for every EVA that we plan. I mean, that whole paradigm has to change for exploration. We have to really get out of the ISS mode of thinking because it's, although it's a wonderful platform in certain respects for biological research and a whole bunch of other things, for operations, it's not a great platform, really. I agree, and, and I, I'm waiting for the time when someone says, we need you to go out, put on your EMU, go explore the port trust and bring back a sample. And uh, I don't think we're gonna get there. So the question is, is there utility in using ISS for exploration EVA development? The answer may be not a lot, but um, <laughs> since no one's you know, it's, 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 it's the best critical platform if you have. look at the big right. picture. Uh, the whole idea of a fleet leader and letting, letting the systems fail, and that's a fleet leader in terms of people with their shoulders failing if they work too hard, mm -hmm. and systems. There are some hang-ups in, in making a perfect analogy, but just doing EVA and finding all these problems has been critical. We need to be able to do an EVA without a big deal go out and pick that rock up and you know almost like your sport coat and, and mike i know you've taken care of much of that in your mm -hmm. preliminary designs so, so we we are going to move to exploration pretty quickly so I, and we're sort of gravitating if i may use that word that way uh, i think i saw a couple of questions in the audience that uh, yeah 
Yeah, so it sort of kind of follows on from the last several minutes of discussion. Um, what I was interested in was in thinking of the design of these suits as we're transitioning from, say, a station operations to exploration, is there any discussion in how you, I mean, most of these suits are just multifunctional, right? You put them on and you go, you go do like you would do if you were working in your garage, although it's, I understand it's a little bit more complicated. But are there single purpose suits you might think about developing? And then as, as, as you develop these technologies, transitioning that to a suit that would be used to walk on the surface of another body? And, and how do you plan that pathway from what you're using a suit for right now to what you want to use? Is it a completely different design, a completely different system? How do you bring all of that together um, as you try and learn from what you're doing now, as you're trying to improve what you're doing now, and as you think about where you want to go? I'd be interested in hearing. So okay. I'd like to circumvent that question because okay. you just introduced that topic much more eloquently than, than I had it written down mm -hmm. here. So pretty soon we're going to move to exactly that, how we transition to a system, and I will say a comprehensive EVA system for exploration. Um, so I hold can, that thought run. before Thank we you. go. I think there were a couple of other questions. Yeah, go ahead. I would just like to endorse what Sergey said there about uh, self-sufficiency on board. I'm sure I would be considered ancient, but uh, my contemporaries and I have always felt sorry as you've gotten to 100% air-to-ground communications. Uh, I mean, we really felt bad. Uh, I can tell you that on Apollo 7, we had 4% air to ground, and we were very busy all the time. And then we'd look and look down at the flight plan and would say, uh-oh, we got air to ground coming up. That meant we'd be, have another 12 minutes we're going to have to be talking to the ground. It was always, damn, what, you know, we got to <laughs> get back on the ground with it. So I really encourage the self-sufficiency, sir. <laughs> Thanks. So, was there another one up here somewhere? Yeah, David. Right. We can hear you. All right. uh, what, what Walt just said is so true <clears throat> for actual behavioral psychological health that proficient people are allowed to be proficient and manage and own in, uh, psychologically what they're in. And uh, micromanaging them is probably not a good model for understanding how they'll function in exploration. That's, that's what people are saying. And I, I think that is supported by the literature, too, based on, on what the capability are of the people who go up into space. And if we're flying one year mission in mic micromanagement mode, it wouldn't help much for exploration. <laughs> do, do, do in defense of the system that we have today, I don't think we are kind of micromanaged. In, in, nevertheless, we are 24 hours uh, uh, under under ground control. Yeah. You know, what you, I, don't, I, I felt uh, the ground was really helping if you work with the ground. I felt that if I could follow what they send me up as a timeline, I would be out of trouble. The trouble starts when you start deviating and do things that, that you might need. So, right. so I think there is a good balance there between uh, uh, need of uh, of uh, determining things and and maximizing resources and obtaining the max uh, of the results back. Okay, thank you. I, I would just spend one comment, and that the task complexity we have on ISS right now is is incredibly high. Our task density is high. Uh, one minute you may be doing a combustion experiment, now you may be dissecting a rodent and being required to get a spleen in a jar within five minutes in the fixative. Uh, and you may be a pilot, <laughs> no slam. Um, so having that connectivity to the ground probably is much more salient vis-a-vis -vis operating a national laboratory than it is operating a post of exploration where, uh, where you're going out to see things you haven't seen before. Uh, so with that, I, I would like to capitalize on the great introduction we had up there. And um, let's talk about transitioning then indeed to an exploration environment. So with what we have, what we have done, what we know now, uh, a comprehensive EVA capability for surface exploration, lunar with the idea of maintaining that capability, Mars obviously something new. We need a suit, suit interfaces that maps to the cabin atmosphere, that maps to the tools, the exploration scenario, uh, the number of crew involved, and uh, how you design your tasks, how smart are your systems. Uh, so I'd like to give that big question as an intro to Dr. Gernhardt. 
and uh, give us at least some top thoughts on the integrated uh, big factors of atmosphere, suit pressures, and uh, exploration scenarios. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, as we move into exploration, it's a totally different EVA environment. Um, we're not going to be able to do 10 to 1 training runs. A lot of the tasks are skill-based exploration tasks in terms of geology and so forth. So we don't really need a, a lot of the ground interaction. In fact, over the last eight years, I've worked uh, in our, with my team in the analog environment. And we had metrics that the geologists would score us on these simulations we did out in the desert. And we actually did every bit as well when we had what we called twice a day communications where they give us a brief in the morning and we go execute the flight plan and then feed back to them at night. Uh, we did another mission where we were simulating time delay associated with an asteroid that was 50 seconds each way. And this was in a submarine in a lake called Pavilion Lake where we found these life forms called microbialites. And these submarines are one man subs and you fly them with your feet and you're running a manipulator. It's a very high workload. And we looked at three different comm latencies. One was the twice a day where you got a pre-brief and a post-brief. And then we had real-time comm. And that was the worst because you're sitting there flying the sub and these scientists are going like, okay, go look at this, go look at that. The visibility wasn't very good. And for you pilots, it was like you know, flying an ILS to minimums and having somebody ask you to do a geological survey on short <laughs> final. <And laughs> so when we cut over to the 50 second time delay, it was like wonderful. It just was so much easier to, to pilot the sub and make decisions and we came up with techniques for communicating and so forth. Um, on top of that, the other big difference is the exploration atmosphere. Space station is at 14.7 PSI for ground control experiments and so forth, but that is not the pressure of choice for doing EVA. I mean, we have to fight to get out the door. The Russians use a 5.8 PSI suit, which has a 30-minute pre-brief, but actually the procedures are more like 60 minutes by the time you get through it. In the U.S., I've led the development of all these complicated pre-brief protocols to use exercise to try to get rid of the nitrogen. And, and we define this thing called the work efficiency index. And basically, right now, we're spending two and a half hours inside the spacecraft for every hour outside. And as a former commercial diver, to me, that's absurd. And so I, I've worked over the last eight years, and we've driven out this exploration atmosphere, which is 8.2 PSI, 34% oxygen. So it puts us in a much better place for minimizing pre-breath to go EVA. And then we've developed these things called suit ports. And basically, the suits are hanging on the back of a rover. And the suits are actually outside the rover. And we open up a bulkhead hatch on the inside and then the backpack of the suit. And we step into the suit and close the two hatches. And now you only have to depressurize the small vestibule between the two hatches. And so we can actually get out the door in about 11 minutes. And the way our pre-breathe works is um, after doing our purge and leak checks, we drop the suit pressure to 6 PSI for 15 minutes. And that's enough time to undersaturate the nitrogen in your brain and spinal cord and basically eliminate the risk of serious decompression sickness. And after that 15 minutes, the suits then drop down to 4.3 PSI. So what that enables you to do, if you combine that capability with a mobile asset, with windows that allow you to make observations from inside almost as well as outside, you don't have to do these six and eight hour EVA. So you're, you're driving around, you make better decisions on where you're gonna sample, you go out and do a 30 minute EVA, and you're very productive. Um, I always say it's an honor to do an EVA, but not a pleasure because it's kind of painful <laughs> at six and eight hours. But with these 30 minute EVAs, it's, it's a pleasure. I mean, you go out, you come back in, you have a cup of coffee, you're talking to your geology crewmate about decisions you're gonna make. And when you're sitting there inside the pressurized rover in a comfortable short sleep environment, you're thinking a lot clearer. Um, I spent probably 100 hours in suits doing lunar simulations. And walking at the lunar level of gravity, you're spending about 30% of your brain cells just staying stable um, to keep control of yourself. And, and so you're actually a lot better off if you're inside. And if, if you go fast forward to Mars, when we first land there, you're not gonna be acclimated. And you know, depending on who you talk to, it could be various lengths of time. But if you were landing in one of these rovers, you could drive off and then 
you know, when you started feeling better, you could do a 30 minute EVA. You're not stuck with doing the eight hour EVA. So I, I think that's very much the, the approach going forward. The autonomy is, is big. Um, in, and as I said, most of these exploration tasks, you're gonna be trained on the skills and there's not that many tools. There's maybe six or eight tools you need to learn as opposed to a station assembly task where it's super complicated. So you're doing the same things again and again and again at different sites. So it's actually a lot easier with respect to the, to the mental um, workload and, and you don't need that ground IV and so forth. Now, when you're talking about repairs, that kind of falls back into a station type of thing. And um, I'm looking at Dave Wolf, but we started the um, skills training back in about 2000, where we basically gave people plenty of runs to learn the skills, to do generic maintenance. And that was huge. Uh, we took people that probably you know, weren't naturally great at EVA, and after, you know, 10 or 15 runs, they were, they were quite fine with that. And, and so, you know, I think we need to continue that kind of skills training and then combine that with the exploration atmosphere and this uh, more elegant egress effort where you don't have to spend so much time getting out the door. Great. So I love that story. That's fascinating stuff but uh, up until the end which is <laughs> which is you know the part that you've got to go repair the spacecraft because you know we're not going to be doing Apollo style missions where we're spending three days on the surface and coming home so I think the message is that in addition to making the sortie you know geological sample based EVA simple we've got to make the vehicle interfaces for maintenance simple and you know that's something that takes a long time to develop. And back to the ISS thing, that's a good use for that platform, is, is testing out interfaces in a long duration environment to see how they do, see how they hold up, and see how, how we can simplify so we're not futzing around with 10 steps to open a quick disconnect on a fluid line like we are right now. Right. And even back into the spacecraft design, as Sergey mentioned, you know, cut the comm for a week and see what's bad about that. And, and we've been trying to, to get time delay worked in, and Station is such a complicated organization and so forth, it's hard to do that, but it's, a, it's something that we have, and if you drag mission control through that, then they will understand that's a bad system for exploration, and I think the design of the spacecraft is much more like some of the JPL or the, you know, the, the remote spacecraft that are more autonomous, and I think we need to learn those lessons in the human arena and then understand techniques for communicating over time delay and, and as Mike points out, designing the vehicle where it can be repaired and where uh, there's a term that JPL uses which is time to criticality. So as long as nothing can fail, so that the time to criticality is longer than the round trip calm time plus the ground processing time, then you can use the ground to help you with, with some of these repairs. Okay. Well, we're fighting a psychology and natural culture where the complexity and the rate of work will get as fast as it can that the system will allow. So we have constant calm on multiple loops, and you, we can't slow it down in order to test some of these concepts, or Bill Gerstenmeyer will get in trouble for underutilization. You're in here somewhere. He's not here. That's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, you know, what did you do with those three hours? Yeah. And, and <clears throat> Judy's science will, could have been done in that delay time if there would have been the fast coupling. So we're fighting our own culture here in some sense. Okay. And so I, it's probably as certain as anything is <clears throat> in human spaceflight that the next big exploration steps will be international. And we have this international infrastructure and a model of working together now. So I'd like to hear from others on our panel uh, from the, uh, the Russian side, Japanese, European, on the notion of an integrated uh, concept for EVA for surfaces. So uh, to <clears throat> focus that a little bit, um, you guys use a higher pressure suit than we do on the Russian side. Uh, how will we come together and decide on a suit pressure and a cabin atmosphere that supports that and what's a good forum uh, for those discussions? Well, what uh, Mike said that uh, even pressure inside the vehicle not necessarily should be the same as on the station. And we can be already in depressurized or low pressure mode, uh, so we don't need any pre-breathe maybe. So a lot of things will depend on, on design. And I think 
for, for future <coughs> development, we just have to bring common sense together. Robust and simple. Right. That seal has to work every time with dirt, fleet leaders that are dirt blown on them. EVA is pretty clean in a vacuum, but all these planetary EVAs are very dirty. I know you, you think an awful lot about that. And a simple backup, you, you put your garage door over, if it doesn't work, you don't have to mate, and you're, you're still simple. And coming in, then you repair it in a slower mode. And quickly for Dr. Gernhardt, the work that you guys are doing on exploration atmospheres, is any of that collaborative at this point, or do we have any kind of a mandate to uh, it's, work across it's partners? It's not collaborative at this point. And it's, <clears throat> frankly, kind of on hold for the moment because, you know, people are looking ahead and saying we're not going to be doing this high-frequency VA for some time now. Um, I think that's maybe misinformed because we're actually designing suits and suit ports and things like that, that we actually need to, to validate this atmosphere. And, um, and I think that's a good thought, is if we can go forward with some of this research, I think it should be collaborative. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to, to get other minds engaged and, and start the internationals thinking about those pressures and so forth. And the, the other point I would make is that for the transit vehicle, like if we go to Mars or, or Phobos, the moon of Mars, um, we probably are okay to operate that at 14.7, and, and the truth is all of our countermeasures that we have on station are based on 14.7 PSI. So on the way out there, you're probably not going to be doing a lot of EVA, so you can tolerate that. But once you get to the destination, you know, then you want to operate at these lower pressures. Okay. Anyone else on the panel on exploration EVA capability? I totally agree with uh, Mike uh, Garnhart about this uh, having this similar interface for oxygen or pressure, water kinds, and stuff like that, so that the many more countries can participate in this effort, not as a you know space suit system itself, but as a like subsystem participation. If you have this kind of interface, it makes it easier for a lot of people to participate. Right. How about from the audience on expression? Yeah, Larry, go ahead. He's coming. Ah, good point. So anyone else who has taught a course on, uh, on EVA, and I've taught one on Apollo, uh, shows the same slide. You show the evolution of suits on the Russian side, on the American side. And the frightening thing is how little they've evolved. They really, they're, you know, one might say, well, they were good enough to begin with, or they might say that it's too expensive to add to the system to make any changes, but they're really not very different. And I'd be interested in the uh, panel's view, and maybe I have to exclude Mike, Mike from this because we work together, the panel suit on dramatically new, revolutionary new suits, and I'm thinking of Professor David Newman's bio suit that I think you've all seen examples of, a skin-tight suit a direct descendant, by the way, of the invention of Paul Webb, who just passed away. Mm -hmm. So for uh, some of our partners in the audience, this is a, a different concept for maintaining body integrity using elastic counterpressure <coughs> garments, tight fitting, rather than a pressure tight envelope. So basically a generic question of escaping the paradigm of a pressurized vessel with movable joints towards something more conformal. Second, second. Second skin type. So just to make the point, it uses elastic counter pressure rather than gas pressure. Mechanical be, pressure. Mechanical pressure, and it's like pressure it's balance, so you've got basically good. unlimited range of motion. If it could work, it would be wonderful. Yeah. <clears throat> if, if, if you have to have these materials with backwards properties, right, that they, their tension curve is opposite. They get longer with less tension. They're doing, uh, they're doing a lot of work on advanced materials. They do. Memory, it will work memory. someday is the point, but it takes these incredible new properties of materials. <laughs> so that you don't, you know, instead of rubbing holes in yourself, I don't mean yeah. that I mean, yeah. One of the, the factors there, and I'm pretty familiar with this work, um, and at JSC, back in the mid-90s, we actually built a glove out of that. And, you know, if you take a phase six glove without the TMG on it, it's fabulous. I mean, you can pick up a dime. 
And so even, even with the elastic counterpressure suit, by the time you put thermal and micrometeorite protection on, hmm. you start losing your dexterity. So I, I think as much as anything, we need to work on materials for the, the <coughs> thermal micrometeorite protection garment to make that more flexible because the pressure bladder itself is not that bad. And then other things like the Orlon suit, the, the lining in there is, is like this silk comfortable lining. On our suit, we have this rough bladder that's just giving you bruises and you're hanging up on it. And you know, these are not hard things to do. You know, just select the right coefficient of friction and, and you know, really tweak some of these human factors, um, taking advantage of what, what we see in the Orlon suits. And, and, and um, you know, I, I don't know that we need to, to go all the way to that mechanical counter pressure. But Mike, there's a few like, not having to change a CO2 cartridge, a regenerable system, a few step improvements. That sure. would be huge operational improvements. Right. Yeah. That cuts your maintenance uh, and your overhead down and all that. And, and we're actually heading there, as you know, with, the, with these swing beds where we don't even have to change out right. uh, a sorbent or a med medox canister. But not to poo-poo innovation, try to translate that. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> You want to have all the innovation you can, yeah. but they did an awfully good job in Apollo with sublimators and certain technologies, but some may not work in some, some of these atmospheres. I'm not sure a sublimator works on Mars for cooling, for example. We're right. going to have to have a new technology. And, and Larry, I didn't mean to poo-poo the technology. I mean, I think it's great we're doing that, and, and we ought to be doing that, and if it pans out, that's great, and if it gets, gets us thinking a little bit differently, that's good as well. And the bottom line, uh, Dr. Young, I don't think we're familiar with the nearness of the technology yet. And if Professor Newman were here, she could tell us on that. But, uh, but I agree. We certainly encourage alternative solutions to it. But I mean, to say uh, something optimistic about that in, in the same vein, but maybe not going so far as that kind of a dramatic technology change. Um, what, so what NASA has done with a couple of the recent commercial programs is shown that technology that's been around a while um, can be done not just by governments with very expensive um, development contracts, but by commercial companies that can take advantage of modern design and manufacturing techniques. And so this fan pump, fan pump separator that is so finicky that we've had trouble with in the EMU, there's probably a better a, a way that we could make it that, fu that function um, with using today's uh, technology that we couldn't, that we didn't do a long time ago. So maybe there's an intermediate step in using the commercial world to help develop those sorts of things that's, you know, short of the, the giant leap that we're talking about. Actually, in some ways, Mike, um, our fan pump separator is way more complicated than it needs to be. If you Russia's decouple those, that's my fan point. pump and a separator. If you decouple of those functions, <laughs> it's more robust and. And, they and a lot simpler and more maintainable. Koichi says you can buy an LCVG for six hundred dollars. <laughs> I wonder what an LCVG would cost here on NASA LCVG. Uh, they're about twenty-five thousand. There you go. Wow. I think there's a merging of the or Russian and the U.S. suit that's pretty close with a few upgrades you're talking about, Larry. You know, that are pretty innovative. That uh, that that can subsystem upgrades that could meet the need in a simple, robust way. Okay. Anything from, yeah, what Barbara. What recommendations do you have for making that actually happen? Mm. I'd love to hear from each of you. What was the question? <laughs> can, can, uh, Barbara, would you mind using the microphone for our translators, please? What recommendations can you folks share with us to help make this happen where we can get to common interfaces or, or some kind of a common suit, international? Well, I mean, I'll reiterate what I think I just said, and maybe in a different way, but if you were to allow um, commercial companies to get involved with public-private partnerships and give them a specific task, um, just as been proven in the, in the COTS commercial orbital transportation system competition and now it's being done in commercial crew, you get a great deal amount of bank for the taxpayer dollar. So, you know, some kind of an RFI would be a good way to start, say we'd like to do this. I mean, the, the hard part is you're gonna break into the EMU to change these things, that's gonna be a challenge. But you can start thinking about using those partnerships for the next suit, whatever it looks like. And do it in an international, <clears throat> do it internationally. Well, that, 
Barbara, are you saying physically do it with our current equipment, make some upgrades and do it on ISS? Yeah. Because it seems like it's being done. You know, Mike's been leading this group in the human, in, in Judy's area that a lot of this is being done, uh, commonality and a forward development. Well, I, I think when we get to the point that we have an international program, we ought to levy some of these standards. Um, and, and another pet peeve I have in, in our development of the, of the space exploration vehicle that I've been leading, um, one of the things that is crazy on space station is how many tools we have and how many EVA tools we have. And so we actually spent about six months to go around and talk to all the subsystem designers and figure out what tools they needed and we produced not a requirements document about this tool or that tool. We had the frickin' tool kit. <laughs> and we gave it out to the people and said, design your stuff to work with this tool kit. So there's no fuzz on that. And then once a quarter, someone would come back and say, I need this tool. And we had a board and we'd say, all right, maybe, you know, if two guys wanted it, maybe we'd add it. But that's the, that's the way you can control this, and, and it, you need to knock the fuzz off it. On station, we had that goal, and it, you know, a bunch of words, and it just evolved into this mess. In fact, the connectors that Dave has experience with were designed um, in part because Jerry Ross wanted to have connectors that didn't need tools. So we designed all these Symmetrics connectors that didn't need tools, and we ended up with 42 tools to service them. And so, <laughs> you know, we really need, and, and I, I can't overstate that. As we get into exploration, we do not want to make that mistake again. And, and, and that applies to the spacecraft you know, and the suits. But I, I think if we uh, apply the, like, clean, simple, clean, standard, some what? Common sense. In some common sense, and then and then have good communications. I think we can do this. But if you get layers and layers of bureaucracy, and you know, you end up and it's like, oh well, we're too far along. We can't change that. And then, you know, you end up with what we call operator compensation. So all these guys built this great stuff, and then as the crew, you're stuck trying to make it work, and you you spend in you know inordinate amount of time learning how to do all these different things. So we, we sh you know, that's one lesson learned from station that, that we should not uh, forget as we go into the future. You might. Oh, please go ahead. Okay. Yes, the gentleman just in the back. Uh, I was uh, I've been sitting back quiet, but, but, and then Mike tweaked me. <laughs> uh, Mike Gernhardt just made a statement that, that I was gonna talk about tonight, so I'll talk about it earlier. Uh, we do have an international program. You know, the, what we're doing right now is a collaborative internet, we're not gonna explore by ourselves. I come to this forum every year because we get everybody who's gonna participate in this stuff and we get ideas and the question, Barbara, was that you that asked the question? It is, it is the perfect question. How do, we, how do we make all this stuff that we come here and talk about happen? You know, Anessa last year uh, talked about the fact that Cruz, I think she heard you all say that you wanted to work more collaboratively on station and doing experiments. That the Russians wanted to come out of the Russian segment into the US segment and into Jim and participate in experiments the way that we thought it was gonna work. And so my impression, this is what happens when you live in the castle in DC. You know, my impression was then people in this room were gonna go off and make that happen. And, and then I heard some things today that, that, that made me begin to believe that nothing has changed that we're still operating in the Russian segment and we're operating in the U.S. segment and that is not the way it's supposed to be. So, I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm the NASA administrator, but I don't, I don't make people do things. I try, to, I try to encourage people to work collaboratively. We've got to do that. Uh, Mike L.A. talked about dependence on commercial. Um, we are where we are today because we decided we would turn to the commercial world to offload some of the stuff that we, NASA, and our international partners could not do if we were gonna explore. Um, you know, there are certain things, I, I love listening to everybody, everybody has an idea, and all ideas are good, but I'm a Marine, I think all of you know that. If you sit around and you think about all the ideas and you don't make a decision to go in a direction, you're going nowhere. So you'll hear me talk about it tonight. We made, a, we made a crucial decision internationally, and it's in the Global Exploration Roadmap. 
And, and it is also emphasized again in the most recent NRC report that came out this week that it depends on which paper you pick up, uh, you know, what, what, the re what the reporter thinks the committee said. Well, it was one of the most positive, encouraging reports that I've ever seen on human exploration in which the committee told us, and I went back and double checked with, uh, you know, with, with Mitch Daniels, the, the president of Purdue, former governor, former head of OMB, all this stuff, to say, okay, I may be, I may be disconnected from what you debriefed me because what I'm reading in the paper that you said in the press conference, it don't match. He said, I didn't say any of that in the press conference. You know, what I said to you is what the committee really meant. You all have a hard road ahead in what you want to do with exploration, but it must be done. You know, Mars has to be the horizon destination for humanity. Now, take it or leave it. That's the path on which we're going. And, uh, and so, you know, that's what you all talk about every year. How do we make it possible for humans to go there? You shouldn't be coming here as an academic exercise. And, and I, I know what I'm saying sounds kind of crude, maybe, or, or, or rude or something, but, but we do have an international, commercial, collaborative program, and we're trying to figure out how to get the most bang for our buck, because there's not going to be a lot more money. We're getting incremental <coughs> amounts more. When you look at NASA's budget that's coming for 2015, um, that was a monumental gain, you know, $400 million more in the budget. Now, it's not signed into law yet, but it's $400 million more than the President asked for. And most of it is in the right places, not all of it. Um, so you all have to help me help you make some of this stuff that you talk about in this forum actually happen. And if you, if you see it's not happening, then, then we need to know about it. Um, but everything I've heard here is right on the, on the money. But we got to do it. Uh, you know, we, we can't keep coming back year after year after year. I know we're making progress, but, but we got to move a little bit faster. We have some commercial entities that are doing 3D printing for components on turbo pumps and stuff like that. And they're flying them. We're not. You know, we're treating it in NASA as if that's new. Uh, that's not new. Um, you know, we've got some of our commercial partners that are doing some of this stuff that we tout as being new. Um, so the, the not, invented, not invented here syndrome is still around, and we can't be guilty of it. Uh, I get off my soapbox now, but I, you, you tweaked me with what you said. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Mike. All right, thank you, Mr. Bolton. I, I guess I would bring that back to the EVA world and say that for a station, EVA is kind of a support role. For exploration, EVA kind of becomes the mission. We're going to go out there and explore the surface. So if we're building a system that starts around that mission, the system needs to conform to our EVA a lot more than our EVA needs to conform to our station, if you agree with that. And I would only submit that perhaps some international forum sooner than later might be appropriate to make sure that that common sense uh, is infused early. Another point, just to extend what you just said, um, right now, not every crew member can be a high-performing EVA person because of anthropometric or other physical attributes, mental attributes. As we go forward into exploration, every crew member needs to be a high performer because we're going to go and do spacewalks. And so we need... Select better? We need <laughs> or train them. So th that's a great point. So I've been doing a bunch of suit research, and we're finding that things like center of gravity <clears throat> for planetary exploration is huge. Um, and there are center of gravities that are so bad that it's way worse than having a heavy suit. And everybody's a different size and shape. And there are some CGs that were near perfect for me that for shorter guys, they hated it. And so we really need to understand that. Mike L.A. mentioned the, the longer plus on the yes. Orlon gave you more pitch stability. Um, I actually noticed between my first spacewalk where we didn't have the safer and then just adding the safer, it, it gave you more pitch stability. You take that into the planetary environment where we did tests on the Pogo system and then on the parabolic plane and, and, and the MBL. CG is a major factor that the engineers aren't necessarily paying a lot of attention to. And so we need, 
We're building suits. We need to test humans in the loop in the suits <coughs> of sizes that represent the selected uh, astronaut population. Um, at some level, if you know, and I'm not biased whatsoever. We started with first to 99th percentile, but a first percentile person is probably not even as big as the plus. So there's some people that aren't going to make it, and, and maybe I'm too tall, and that's too bad because I want to go. But um, you know, you you should have your suit and your system synced up with the selection process. And as Sergey points out, you know. Some people are naturally good at EVA and some people aren't and they can learn and then some people just aren't going to get it. And, um, you know, we need to sort of screen for that and, and uh, you know, uh, some of that's physical and some of it's mental. Okay, thanks, Mike. Great comments. So uh, we're about midway between my two stopping points. I had a choice of two. Um, I'd like to just go ahead and open it for final comments uh, from the panel and then uh, final questions from the audience. So. Well, I'll just um, pick up on what Mike was pulling on a little bit, and that is we, you know, as if we do some kind of a, um, either a lunar-based exploration or eventually Mars or, or a moon of Mars, um, astronaut selection is going to be very important, and we have really struggled lately in the last probably four or five selections to try to include some kind of an EVA criterion in that, um, which is obviously very difficult to assess in, in the short period of time that folks are down there. Um, <clears throat> it, but on the other hand, you know, we have certain diversity requirements uh, as a government agency to, that we have to meet, and, and those two sort of paths are, are, they collide with each other. I mean, you've got to pick which of these things is important. Am I going to just pick my A team and say they're going to be the ones that are going to go do this, or am I going to pick a, a diverse uh, population? And it becomes sort of a, an, almost an ethical question. I don't have the answer to that. I think it's something for all of you to think about, though. Well, and I, I think the engineering comes into that. If we can design suits, with the right size <coughs> mix and the right CG to, to address the population that we select, that goes a long way. If, if the efforts are completely decoupled where we've got engineers designing a suit that might be a great suit for some people but not for another person and we don't find that out until years later, that's a big disconnect. And so we, we really need to have the human in the loop testing uh, early on so we understand that performance. Anyone else from the panel? Okay, from the people at large, yes. A conversation, but it may actually, given what was just said, it may actually be um, uh, relevant now. But I, I would presume that as we go to exploration of other bodies, that it will be, it won't just be humans, it'll be human robots together. Whether that robot's an exoskeleton or a remote control rover or, or whatever the astronaut is, is working with. So how does that factor into the design of the suit? And if you're worried about CG, maybe there's a suit exoskeleton interface with that, that basically countermands the need for that because now you've got the system being held up by some clever exoskeleton that integrates with the suit. So how, I, I mean, instead of thinking of where we are now and this is how we do things, even though we're trying to extrapolate to a different environment, we should also be extrapolating into how we do different operations. And I, I really think that in the next 20, 30 years, that human-robot interface is going to be so important for the kinds of exploration we're talking about. And I'd be interested to see how that factors in to your thoughts about what we need to be looking at now for the suit design for the future. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, very cheaply include that in a comprehensive EVA solution, which includes things such as robotics, rovers, cabin atmospheres, <coughs> and orbiting, uh, orbiting satellites of another body as well for recon. Yeah, well. <coughs> well, I'll date myself again, but it's not the least bit inconsistent with what you've had to say in this panel. I find it a very interesting panel but every one of you has got the experience of doing it. Well, we've been talking about EVA and exploration. And as I look at it, the uh, ISS, which marvelous machine up there, 
but it's a it's a, an environment that's uh, a perfect description, I think, of uh, having the crew members be really uh, an extension, a remote manipulator for the scientists on the ground. And that's not the same as autonomy, and there's always some things that fit in each category. But as we move out to go to Mars, that's going to be <clears throat> autonomy is going to be much, much more critical. And so I've also heard a couple of comments here recently. What we need to do is select the best person for the job, get rid of the things like one to 99 percentile uh, for suits, and uh, get the best person you can for the job, let them do that job. You, if you have 100 percent air to ground communication, let them use it when they need it. But we need to get the best people able to do a, that job and not worry about things like diversity and things like that anymore. Other comments? The only thing I would add to that is that uh, first steps are always hardest and probably the most limiting. Every time we open a frontier, we try to expand the number and types of people who can follow us into it. So there is a cost and ethics trade-off as, as we approach these things. and. Sometimes I think that approach is, is more necessary for those first steps with the idea of widening it as we go. And, and I hope we do leave the planet that way. So. Any other questions? Okay, you guys have been exemplary in your patience, so thank you very much. Okay,